In this series we look at the 10 guilds of Ravnica just before Murders of Karloff Manor. After these 10 videos there will be a huge secret video. I asked what the most popular guilds were and you chose the Boros Legion first. The Boros are the army of Ravnica. They stand for order through conviction and pride. And if the Boros seem boring, that's because that's to be expected from the fighters guild. But through reading a lot about them, I learned that the Boros are really intricate. This army is led by multiple angels, beings of pure magic that shouldn't have feelings, but they still do. And the two colors of the Boros, red and white, are enemy colors. Because white is order and red is chaos. The guild has been alternating focus between the two colors over centuries, which makes for a lot of interesting storylines. The most Boros card I could find is Rally the Righteous, so let's start with it. The art shows us three human warriors and the Minotaur holding their weapons and the tethered Boros banner with a blazing fire behind them. This is your image for the Legion in their prime. No matter who you are, as long as you're ready to fight, you're a valued member of the Legion even if you are a cow. The flavor tells us what happened here. The army was defeated, but Yuri took up a tethered banner, the symbol for unification and strength, and the army rallied, ready to fight for what is right according to the Boros. The mechanic for this card is one that only the Boros have. Radiance means that you target a creature and all creatures that share a color with it. The Legion says that anyone who shares Boros values can join the fray. And the soldiers do rally because they get untapped to fight again with a bunch more power than before. I think that the locket cycle shows us the most of the guilds. The lockets are given to those that are valued by the guild or that fit their culture. The Boros locket teaches us two things. One, Boros chooses to give the lockets only to those that have earned it. The Boros are practical and will not simply give a locket to any trainee. Once you have shown action, you will get one. Lesson number two, you will get the locket from a fellow soldier. The Boros follow a sense of camaraderie. If you are to fit in the ranks, you should be accepted by it. In these videos, I will follow a set in stone structure. We will look at the philosophy of the guild, which we just started to do. We will look at their guild leaders, mechanics, the history of the guild, their roles in the city and their art direction. Beside those things, there will be some space for the things that make the guild unique. But every guild of Ravnica was once formed by their guild leaders, so let's start there. Every guild has their first leader who has the title Perun. For the Boros this is Rajya. Her card with 2 red, 2 white and 4 colorless mana gives you a hasty flying 6-3 that shoots scare your opponent. The colors are balanced on purpose. She has vigilance so after attacking you can still use her ability which is to protect your own army and redirect the arrows of your opponents towards their own ranks. If Razia was the first angel for the Boros, she definitely set the tone with her three damage spells. She does this with brightness according to her flavor and this is a theme for the Boros. This piece of revenge to the Boros shows us how she is balanced. The white color should have her stay back, but once someone doesn't follow the rules, the red color kicks in and burns the criminals alive. The Boros use the symbol of the sun and they access fire magic to burn away darkness. When Razia made the guild pact, she and the other Peruns or first leaders agreed to take on a function that would serve the guild pact. The Boros function was to restrict or defeat anyone that would go against the guild pact. And while the guild pact has changed a lot since then, the Boros still have the same basic function. Even though when they tried to just restrict someone, they might burn them in the process. The second leader was Feather, who was for a shorter time the guildmaster of the Boros. And you don't just become the guildmaster often, but Feather kind of did. Feather was being kept small by having her be in the Wojak League, but even here she disobeyed the Legion eventually. After all the angels disappeared together with the first Perhelion skyship, Feather went to look for them. When she returned because she found them but couldn't return them, she was captured by the Azorius and tortured. Usually the Azorius would go and read her mind and Feather would have been killed. But her lawyer was no other than Tesa Karloth. So she managed to convince the Azorius to act like Feather was the guild leader. For she was the only angel alive. 
so Feather would get an audience with the Sage from every Order-aligned guild. The Boros, Azorius, Celestia and Thesa as the Orts of Sage. She explains that the Boros Angels were looking for a way to get Planeswalkers into Ravnica and that they were trapped in a ghost world. But before that happened, the Parhelion crashed into the Azorius guild quarters and Feather had to investigate the Parhelion. Eventually, Feather would become the guild master of the Boros because the Parhelion was enough evidence that the angels were indeed all gone and that and she became the guild master. Feather's card features more white than red mana. This is because she was not just an angel of revenge, but also one that understood her army because she worked in it for such a long time. She would focus on the army and on their unification, and she would often choose boons for the legion over revenge on darkness. If you want to learn more about Feather and how her card turned the Boros around in more than three ways, I recommend my video about her. But Feather started creating new angels, among which one that wanted to restore the Boros to their old roles. The Boros were falling to chaos. Feather's focus on order instead of enforcement had led to the Boros soldiers becoming unruly. This is where Aurelia comes in. An angel card with two white, two red and three colorless mana. The same color balance as Razia did. Aurelia even sports the same haste, flying and vigilance keywords. But there is one massive difference to be seen in the art. Razia was flying high above. Where we still look up at Aurelia, she is flying low enough to the ground so that we can she can be seen by her soldiers. Aurelia is on the front lines, calling for war. And this is true for Aurelia's mechanics. Whenever she attacks with the Legion, the whole army wants to go in for another skirmish. In her second art, Aurelia has joined the soldiers even more. Now we see the Legion standing ready in the background. And in one of her signature cards, Aurelia even sits next to a fallen foot soldier, beckoning them to fight again for one more time. You will see this a lot with Boros cards, a focus on battle manipulation and mechanics. Her own card sports another of Boros key mechanics, Mentor, because Aurelia along with many other soldiers strive to teach each other how to fight. The mechanic is perfect for the brotherly Boros. And Aurelia will be back for the new set. Interestingly, she is now above the law, or at least she's the law above. She's returned with flying haste and vigilance, and when she attacks with enough of her battalion, she deals 3 damage and heals 3 damage, very much in the likeness of her Perun Razia. And you might remember this effect from the Boros card Lightning Helix. The flavor tells us how the Phyrexian invasion has changed the Boros. Now even the most rank and file soldiers are taught how to use magic. This is interesting because it seems like the classic Boros structure is crumbling away in favor for being even more battle ready. I wonder if this will last. For now, the fighting spirit of the Boros has brought them a stable image. In the War of the Spark, the Boros have led the charge so clearly that even Demir and Simic warriors joined battle. Two guilds that would prefer to be in the dark felt inspired to run after a soldier with a bright sun on top of their helmet. Let's talk about Boros clothing a bit more. The most obvious is that they always wear armor. Symbols of the sun are often visible, like the one on the helmet here and on the sword hilt, and then on the armor the sigil of the Boros is shown. The sun imagery doesn't need to be literal. Here we see the rays of the sun around this mage's helmet, robe and shoulder plate but it's also literally imprinted on the breastplate and shoulder. Aside from this, the Boros are often seen casting fire or light magic. Anything the sun could do, they do as well. On the Boros sigil, the sun surrounds their fiery fist. Their fist of course stands for the fighting spirit. In this particular art of a guild gate, we see how the Boros like to build. The legion wants to be strong and they want to seem strong. So all of their buildings are rigid and firm. It doesn't seem like a storm ram would do anything to these massive walls. Every gate from the latest purely Ravnican set got a backside one too. Usually they seem to be in the shadow, but with the Boros back door we see the sun coming down from above. The flavor again notes the Boros values for mercy and their norm for screaming in battle. Many other Boros lands feature their armies walking through them. 
Usually, not many creatures are seen in lands, but the Legion's armies belong to the cityscape around Boros' own streets. The streets are wide, because the Boros don't like to hide in alleyways, and mostly they need enough space for their ranks to file through in an orderly fashion. Plus, the sunlight needs to come through for their attunement with the sun to shine bright. And the Boros love to shine bright. When Bolas invaded Ravnica and the whole city felt like there would be never a bit of hope returning, the Boros still stood after having lost the most. This flavor says, the sky boiled over the citadel, dire and dark, then the angels brought the dawn. And so the people of Ravnica fought on. You might say this is just simple Bo Boros philosophy, but isn't it interesting that they continue for so long even after they have lost more than the other guilds? Isn't that a sign of uniqueness? As long as there is one rank above you waiting to come, there is still hope. In fact, let's talk about those ranks. At the top, there is the Perun or guild leader. This is up to this point always an angel. In the case of Razia, you could call her the Archangel, because all Boros angels were made from her example. She would have some angelic advisors as well. Then there's the fire main angels. These are the one soldier armies of the Boros. They're only sent on the most important missions, but more often they are left to exact their own judgment. Now here's where there's a change. There used to be a very firm amount of ranks from guild mages to commanders to Wojak police officers to sky knights and to grunts. But nowadays the legion is split into theaters or regions. After the latest wars, they even started dividing their army into districts. But we can still look at the different types of warriors. After the angels, I'd say the minotaurs are often seen leading the army the most. Their battle shapers and commandos and their strength probably means they will get a great place in the army. Add that to their strategic minds and they are fit to be great generals. I would suggest the giants are next. While they're named after their specific functions like dropping a hammer, they're often on the front lines. In Boros language, that means that they own a lot of honor. Then we get the Flamekin. These are engineered by the Boros and the Izzet together. They really show you how it doesn't matter where you're from, it's your actions that show your character for the Boros. This is illustrated through the time after the Decimillennial when the Boros had lost many soldiers. They would recruit soldiers from every guild to protect Ravnica. Then I would name the Swift Blades. This one's flavor even says that they soften up the battlefield for the giants and Flamekin to take the glory. Of course, the Swift Blades have the opportunity to gain a lot from a great fight at the front lines. The Sky Knights used to fall under the Wojak Legion of Street Officers, so they would be ranked under the other soldiers that protect Boros bases like the Sun Home. And then there's the new recruits. You can easily enter the Boros Legion, but you will always start at the bottom. Still, anyone can prove their worth in the Legion. So even this goblin could become a great general. I mentioned Sunholm briefly, but there's a lot more to say. For one, it is a great honor if you are allowed to protect the Sunholm. This guild hall for the Legion is not only their fortress and barracks, but also the place where the Boros used to worship angels. Nowadays, with Aurelia, worship is less prevalent, because Aurelia believes the angels should join their soldiers. Sunholm is protected by some of the greatest warriors the Boros Legion has to offer. The Legion even had the Isidli create warriors made from energy that are only allowed around Sunholm in order to protect the fortress. It's also said that when Boros soldiers come near Sunholm, and when they hear the trumpets from its walls, they're strengthened. Whether this is magical or from pure the motivation is unknown, but hey, it works. And then there's the Perhelion, or well, the second one. The first one was destroyed after a crazy Demir guild leader tried to use it for the destruction of the Azorius, but it was rebuilt. Now it again serves as a base from where angels and griffin knights can fly out. This is why the vehicle makes two angel tokens. A secondary but not less important use for the vehicle is its light because that can apparently burn zombies because the light shows them what they really are. Perhaps they meant that the Amonkhet warriors saw that they used to be warriors or perhaps they mean that they saw what they have become. In any case, 
the zombies are not there anymore. The most interesting cards about the Parhelion are the ones in which it is only depicted. Like with Feather where you can see the skyship in the top right of the art. And weirdly on this Oketra art where we see buildings from Ravnica depicted in the art of the god Eternals that attacked Ravnica. A form of forced irony where Oketra, goddess of order and stability, attacked the symbol of order and stability. Lastly, let us get into the legends of the guild, starting with Tajik. This man is nowadays a warrior that works together with the Izzet to make stronger warriors. This role did not come to him without reason. Let's look at his history. Tajik was conscripted as a maze runner, meaning that he had to follow a magical trace through Ravnica in order to gain great power for his guild. While he had this duty, Tajik got distracted by his seeming love interest Taisa Karlov. Taisa asked Tajik to kill the Obsedat. She told him that she valued integrity over everything, even gold, which was in itself a lie. And Tajik chose to believe that lie. Tajik in turn complimented Taisa on her leadership and this made her blush. Tajik followed Taisa because he really thought she had the best in mind for Ravnica and because she was a stronger leader, wasted under the thumbs of the Obsedat. The two found evidence of their corruption, but the book that contained that evidence was magically stuck because the law magics he tried to use didn't work in the room of the Obsedat. Tajik had blindly followed another and had found his own failure because of it. A simple thrall captured him and put him under arrest because Tajik had been scared of the ghosts that appeared after. Later, when Aurelia wanted to work together with other guilds to fight Nicobolus in the War of the Spark, Tajik went against orders once more. Tajik said that he now only trusts the Boros to protect the Boros. Perhaps this was because his trust had been shattered after his dealings with Teza. But we don't know this for sure. After Tajik had disobeyed his leaders once too often and he had misplaced trust in a select amount of guilds where blindly trusting the Orsov, Tajik was put to the ironic task of having to work together with the Izzet. What a lovely fate. This alliance is also why we see some rocket boosters in Tajik's sword now and also probably why he can't be hit by non-combat damage. Agris Kos is the next legendary Boros. The star of multiple Ravnican lore books, he is the Wojak officer with a drinking problem. He has this drinking problem because he killed his friend out of a sense of justice. This is very Boros of him. In his time, Feather, who later became a guild leader, was in the Wojak League too. Here, the two became great friends. Feather would later move away when the angels had disappeared after the death of Millennial. Agris was left on his own and joined the Orsov to protect the reclamation zone outside of the city of Ravnica. Here he helped battle two dragons, but after being injured, he couldn't be healed because it had been done to him too often. Agris then returned as a ghost, one that uses the radiance ability without the color restriction. Agris cards are always about inspiring others, but when Agris returned as a ghost, he was forced to join the Azorius because he had accidentally signed a contract for 50 years of work as a guard. Here he had lost most memories except for the ones that served his role for the Azorius, like how he upheld the law during life. But he recognized Feather and her name and that he had given it to her. But God Kos was bound by law to stay still and couldn't follow his friend. He still tried to keep remembering her from then on. After saving Ravnica again, he was the main character of course, Feather recruited him again and that's where we find Agris on his card. A very Boris thing to do would be to never show Agris as an Azorius ghost slave on the card. Instead the Boros opted to only show the man in his prime moments, serving the Legion. Lastly, and I think most importantly, I want to talk about my personal favorite planeswalker, Gideon Jura who we see here returning to Ravnica after being away for a long time. He found his company again and instantly they were ready to fight for him once more. When Gideon first entered Ravnica he was on a quest to save Zendikar from aliens, but he got distracted because there was so much tension around him on Ravnica. So the Boers found him fighting a whole battalion of Rakdos trail seekers. Gideon saved the battalion of Boros soldiers 
so Aurelia recruited him as a battalion leader. Gideon's first task was to save the 9th district from a Rectos vs Gruul vs Dimir battle, a district that Feather had neglected. Gideon had to accept because he has a thing for angels and gods, but he had some doubts, so he took the assignment but didn't join the guild yet. Careful man that he is, he baited the whole Gruul clan to run after him in order to lure them into a trap. Tajik had done the same to the Rectos in order to have them neatly fight it out in a square. The two fighting guilds would cancel each other out and the Boros had taken the ninth. And the respect had stayed long enough to rally once more behind Gideon to protect Ravnica against the threat of Nicobolas. Of course Gideon, like the Boros, would never change in this aspect. If they can be heroes, they always will. So who combo jumped off guild leader Rectos trying to hit Nicobolas? Of course. Gideon wasn't done. Because when Liliana, who had betrayed him, more than we can count, had a chance to save Ravnica by burning herself alive from her contract with Bolas, Gideon saved her as well. And I think this little piece of Guildwatch normative talk under the statue of our now lost hero says the most now that we know a bit more about the Legion. Gideon and the Boros will keep watch. And that was it for the story about the Boros, their heroes, leaders, and all that they stand for. I would love to hear what guild you would like to see next. After I've covered all 10 guilds, there will be a very big surprise.